Hey, everybody. I think we'll get started now. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. How many people uh, here came to the AR Core Code Lab, the 101 Code Lab yesterday? Okay, awesome. Thank you for coming again. Um, my name is Matthew Small. I'm the engineering lead for the AR Core Unity SDK. Uh, so I'd like to say my job is to make an awesome experience for Unity developers to use the AR Core platform. Uh, today I'm going to give it a overview of the capabilities that AirCore provides uh, to make immersive and captivating experiences for your users. And I'll also uh, try and mix in some tips and uh, help for getting started uh, developing these experiences in the AirCore Unity SDK. <clears throat> so to start off, I want to ask the question, why AR? Uh, and more specifically, why is now the time for mobile device AR? And why are AR experiences worthwhile uh, for developers to uh, create and for users to consume? One reason why right now is a really good time uh, for mobile device AR is that consumer devices have just reached a point where they're powerful enough to integrate compelling AR experiences into everyday user flows. And uh, this has happened relatively recently. If we think about the standard hardware sensor suite that a lot of mobile devices offer, uh, you have the color camera, the GPS, the IMU, which is the accelerometer and gyroscope, uh, a proximity sensor, the list goes on. Uh, <clears throat> In many ways, AR is providing virtual sensors that aggregate data from these hardware sensors and produce a high-level view uh, of the world around based on this aggregated data. So uh, for example, we aggregate the color camera image data to produce light estimation. We aggregate the color camera and the IMU together to provide motion tracking. It's only because of advancements in mobile device performance that we can provide these computationally complex virtual services uh, at parity with some of these traditional onboard hardware sensors. More important than just the capability of doing mobile AR is the value of doing so. At Google, uh, we believe that mobile devices seeing and understanding the world in a similar way to how human beings see, understand, and perceive the world uh, marks a paradigm shift in computing. So we're really betting on this. As developers, that means you have the opportunity to leverage the understanding uh, that we bring about the world uh, to bring your content into the, into the real world where it's accessible and useful to the user, and importantly, contextually relevant as well. AR allows developers to fundamentally blur the line between the real world and the virtual one. As we're starting down this path with AR, we're just beginning to scratch the surface uh, about uh, when it comes to the utility of AR. By leveraging spatial understanding, users can perform accurate measurements uh, of a room or a coffee table and manipulate a range of products by bringing them into their own space. And we think these are captivating and delightful experiences that can be useful. And of course, uh, AR can be fun. I mean, we're at uh, a Unity Unite, a, a lot of game developers here, uh, so fun is first and foremost when we think about AR generally in this context. AR has been used to tell stories, to play games, uh, to spice up video for social applications, or make whimsical and delightful user experiences. Uh, so now let's talk about some of the technology behind uh, creating these experiences. AR Core, that's what this talk is about. Uh, <laughs> it's Google's platform for developing augmented reality experiences at Android scale. So what does that mean uh, to be Android scale? 
the Android ecosystem has about two billion uh, end user devices in the real world. And AR Core supports over 100 million of those, and we're adding more every day. Uh, so I, we think that's a, a captivating marketplace to, uh, to deliver, a captivating marketplace and audience to deliver your AR experiences. And it's been a busy year for AR Core. Uh, we first launched our developer preview at the end of last summer. Uh, I didn't sleep at all the whole summer, I think. Uh, and from there, uh, we kind of had a frantic pace to a second developer preview in December, our first 1.0 release earlier this year, a middling uh, 1.1 release, and finally at I.O., we came out with a couple of uh, major new announcements with AR Core 1.2, including Cloud Anchors, um, which is the ability to uh, share reference points in the real world between devices, as well as uh, augmented images, which is uh, arbitrary 2D planar marker detection. So you can take an arbitrary image and use that as a marker. Uh, so it's, pretty, it's a, been a pretty exciting year, and uh, now I want to show you some of these features and how to use them uh, in the AR Core Unity SDK. So before we talk about those features, we're going to talk about uh, some of the prerequisites for developing uh, AR Core and Unity. Uh, the first thing you need, uh, obviously, is a, a device that supports uh, AR Core. The second thing you need uh, is a Unity Editor version that supports AR Core. Currently, that's 2017.4 or later. Uh, and the last thing you need is our AR Core Unity SDK. So uh, the SDK is a normal Unity package. You're going to be able to download it from our developer site at developer.google.com slash AR and, uh, and import it into your project. If you're already developing for Android, it's as simple as dragging a prefab into your scene for the AirCore device to get motion tracking and background rendering working. So we've tried to make this as simple for developers as possible and in line with Unity's uh, best development practices. Here is a list you probably can't see because the text is kind of small of the devices that AR Core uh, currently supports. Uh, as I mentioned, it's about uh, it's over 100 million devices in the marketplace and uh, and quite a few individual models. Uh, and this information is always available on developers.google.com/ar. So. If you go here, you'll be able to find uh, reference documentation for our APIs. Uh, we obviously are talking about the AR Core Unity SDK today, uh, but we also have an SDK uh, for another uh, engine that may rename, na <laughs> remain nameless. Uh, <clears throat> start, it, it rhymes with uh, Shrum Real, and uh, <laughs> as well as uh, uh, Java and a native, uh, a native SDK. And at Google I.O., we announced uh, support for a new way to interact with the, for native uh, Android developers called SceneForm. So you might check that out. So uh, one of the first uh, capabilities we're going to talk about that AR Core provides is motion tracking. Uh, to perform motion tracking, AR Core uses what's called visual inertial odometry. And that's like a really fancy term, but it's actually really simple. Uh, this means that we look for visually distinct features in each camera frame uh, and compare uh, them to features that were found in the previous frame. So uh, if we see a pattern on the wall or, or a color variation, uh, we're going to look for that between consecutive frames. And then uh, we're going to calculate relative movement based on the average of a lot of those features that we're finding between the frames. And that's the visual part, right? 
So uh, the inertial part is the fact that we use the IMU, the accelerometer and gyroscope, uh, to augment this pose estimation from the visual aspect. So visual inertial odometry. And odometry just kind of means motion tracking. So the result of this process is a pose and orientation estimation for the device as it moves through space. Uh, and we map that to how the device moves through your scene in Unity. Uh, to get started with motion tracking in Unity, I told you it's, it's very simple. So once you uh, have downloaded the AR Core SDK, we have uh, this prefab called AR Core device that you can drop in your scene. Uh, <clears throat> to do the, uh, we're going to look at the first person camera component of the AR Core device in this picture. And we see that it has a tracked pose driver attached. Uh, this tracked pose driver actually ships with Unity as part of their XR namespace. And uh, it will pick up poses from uh, an active AR Core session and mirror them on the transform of the game object that this component is attached to. So basically, as the device moves through space and we track that movement, we're going to make the attached game object of the tracked pose driver move through your virtual scene. And the, the reason that we see the virtual objects move uh, and see, or well, actually stay still uh, is because we attach a camera component, as you can see, right beneath the transform. So we're controlling the virtual camera in the scene based on the movement of the user's device through the, the space in the real world. For AR, we usually want to also render uh, a color camera background because that brings, uh, brings the real world into the view, right? Because we're mixing the virtual world and the real world. So we see how we're moving the camera through space and the AR Core background renderer, uh, which is the component at the bottom of the screen, is used to render the color camera image each frame that comes in from the color camera. And we do that through, uh, through this color camera script and a background material uh, that we supply as part of the, plug the, the plugin, but you can also override if you want to do any kind of crazy effects on the background image. Yeah, so we, as, as I kind of alluded to, we conveniently put all these uh, on the first person camera game object, which is part of the AR Core device prefab. The AR Core device prefab is also responsible for session and lifecycle management, essentially communication with the lifecycle of AR Core. So uh, by dropping this one prefab in your scene, you get that lifecycle management that's going to enable and, uh, and manage the session for AR Core, as well as the motion tracking and the background rendering. That's all in one prefab that you just drop in your scene. Another uh, capability that AR Core provides is lighting estimation, which calculates the intensity and color correction for the ambient light in the real world. This enables developers to better match the lighting of their models to reflect the lighting conditions in the real world and preserves the illusion of presence. This is kind of a fun little demo that we made in our initial developer preview for Oz and uh, the Cowardly Lion responds to the lights going off. And as you can see, the lighting on the model is also updated uh, based on the new color, the new lighting situation in the real world. So if lighting is, estimation is enabled in a session, then AR Core will provide raw lighting estimation values each frame. That means an intensity and a color correction that developers are free to use any way they want. Uh, and that will be part of the static frame uh, class. However, the, the easier way or the, the most simple way to use lighting estimation is via the environmental light prefab. So you can see it pictured here. It's just a prefab with one script on it. And 
what this prefab is responsible for is taking those lighting estimation values each frame and making them accessible to our global shaders that we include uh, in our SDK. So the second step, we see that we have a diffuse lighting, uh, diffuse with lighting estimates, pardon me, diffuse with light estimation shader and a specular with light estimation shader. Those shaders will take the value, the lighting values that the environmental light prefab provides and apply them to any materials that uh, those shaders are being used on. And the last step is you get happy plants. I think I, I stole this from a Unity blog. I thought it was kind of cute. Another capability that AR Core provides is environmental understanding. So uh, this attempts to understand the physical structure of an environment and present that information to developers in an intuitive abstraction. Uh, two of the ways that we do this uh, in the AR Core Unity SDK are to provide planes, uh, detected planes, which are either horizontal uh, or vertically oriented surfaces, so things like floors, tables, walls, uh, as well as a point cloud. Uh, and some of those points can, can be microsurfaces. We call them oriented points. Uh, so it essentially gives you a normal on the point of how we think that point uh, uh, is oriented relative to the surface that we've detected it on. And you can use a combination of these planar surfaces and uh, the feature point cloud to uh, place your virtual objects relative to the physical environment. Again, uh, and this is how we start a lot of AR games, like a tabletop game. So here's some code. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> This is actually directly grafted from our Hello AR example. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through it super briefly uh, so that I don't bore anyone to tears. Uh, uh, this, this is essentially responsible for uh, raycasting against any planes, uh, uh, so accepting a user's touch input and using that to generate a ray into whatever AR core has detected. And if we find a plane or an oriented point, then we're going to place a model of Andy the Android. And this is, uh, again, under our examples in the SDK. It's uh, the Hello AR example. So the first two lines, uh, we're setting up a filter for what type of trackables we want to hit. And we're doing uh, a bit flag uh, of a combination of planes within the polygon, which means that we want a planar surface, which also has a polygon on it. And if the ray passes through that polygon that we've detected is the edge of the plane, then uh, we want that to be a valid hit. The other thing we want to do is detect feature points with a surface normal. So uh, these are these oriented points that I've talked about before. So if we if the ray, and we fudge a little bit here because it's really a cone that we project out uh, to detect these, these uh, intersections with points. Uh, if we intersect with a point that's on a surface and we have a normal value for that point, uh, then we want, to detect, we want that to be included as a hit in our ray cast. The if state, so uh, then the next statement is if frame, frame dot raycast, we pass the touch position, uh, X and Y, the raycast filter, and we, uh, we, we output a hit. Um, and the frame dot raycast returns true if it's hit anything and false if it hasn't. Does this look familiar? Anyone? Yeah? So it looks uh, a lot like Unity's raycast method. And we've, uh, we've tried to design uh, it to be a familiar experience for developers. The next if, if block just uh, uses the dot product to detect if we hit the back of a plane. So we only want to hit uh, the front of planes. And then the else fall through is where we've hit 
a plane or a uh, oriented point, the front of a plane or an oriented point, and we're going to place an Andy object. So we instantiate a prefab at the hit.pose.position, hit.pose.rotation. So that's where the incidence uh, point of the ray on whatever we hit. And then we rotate, uh, we, we rotate the model, uh, the Andy model, to be facing away from the ray cast, so it's aligned um, towards the camera. And then we create an anchor so that as our understanding of the space in AR core evolves over time, we have this Andy object that's also going to benefit from that knowledge. So whenever we create an anchor, it's saying, I care about this point and I want this point to stay where it is even as uh, AR core updates its understanding of the world. And lastly, uh, we parent uh, the Andy prefab to the anchor that we created at the hit incident. So that's the only code. We got through it. One of the new features that we added to the AR Core Unity SDK uh, in our 1.2 release at Google I.O. was augmented images. And this gives you the ability to trigger an AR experience off of a real world image, uh, like taking a movie poster and bringing it to life. So let's look at how that works in Unity. The first step is to select the images that you want to detect. This is done by selecting images in the Unity Editor, right clicking, and we have an option to add them to a new augmented image database. And these are going to be a database of up to 1,000 images that you want to scan for in the real world environment and potentially trigger an experience off of. The second step is to build your application and detect those images. So if you attach that database to your configuration, you say, I want to detect images in this database, then AirCore will scan and let you know um, when such an image has been detected. The last step is to handle the image detection when it occurs. So the developer can recognize the images by a, a name that they've assigned to it in the Unity Editor, and then they can trigger uh, an AR experience of their choosing from that. Uh, what they probably want to do is create an anchor on the, tra so we're going we're gonna to surface a detected image, AR Core detected this image, and that's a trackable, just like everything else in the AR Core SDK that uh, we detect in the environment. And you can add an anchor to that. And again, anchor means I want to attach to this point, and I care about this point. And then from that anchor, which is a game object, you can attach whatever you like, and it will be fixed to that real-world uh, augmented image, or real-world image, I should say. And this is what a database looks like in the editor. Uh, so this is actually part of our augmented image sample in the SDK. We have, uh, we have in the top picture uh, highlighted example database in the hierarchy, and in the inspector we see uh, several images in the database, uh, as well as a, a width suggestion. It happens to all be set to zero in this case, but uh, tracking can be improved when you give a width suggestion for the real world inches that uh, the image is going to have. Uh, that will be an optimization and then a quality uh, metric. So the quality is going to let the developer know this is a very good image for, uh, for doing image detection or marker detection, or this might be a very bad image. So if you load in uh, 
a PNG that is all white, for example, or all black, or just nothing, uh, we're probably going to give you a quality score of zero because that's going to be very hard to detect. Uh, but if you give something like the picture of the Earth that is uh, texturally complex, then it gets a very good score. In this case, 100 out of 100. And then at the bottom uh, of the slide, we see a picture of the, the augmented image session configuration, the session configuration for the augmented image example. And we see that we've attached at the bottom under augmented image database, that augmented image database. So in that example, we'll go and detect images uh, from that. One of the new features that I'm most excited about is Cloud Anchors. I think it's really cool. Um, cloud Anchors allow one device to specify a real location and another device to resolve that same real world location. Uh, this is obviously super useful for creating multiplayer AR experiences. Uh, and it's our first feature that supports both Android and iOS. So you can have one Unity project uh, that's a multiplayer game, for example, that targets uh, and works uh, between uh, an iPhone and an Android phone, for example. Let's uh, watch this video. So we know what Cloud Anchors can do, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about how they work. Uh, uh, this is a high-level overview you see here. So the first step is that device one explores and creates a Cloud Anchor. So we see that we're detecting feature points on this table, and then we create uh, a Cloud Anchor, that, and that data is uploaded to the Cloud. Uh, from that process in Unity, the, we're going to get an ID for that space in the real world. So we've, we picked a, a point, a position and rotation in the real world, and we're going to get an ID for that. Uh, we, device one can then share that ID with device two. Device two can come in and say, I want to resolve this real world location associated with the ID that I got from device one. And then as device two moves around that same location, uh, it will be resolved and they'll have uh, access to a, an anchor, a, cl a local anchor, uh, that represents that same real world location. So then, they can then the developer can launch, for example, a shared multiplayer experience. So I think we're almost out of time, and uh, that's all the features I have to talk about for today. And I hope that maybe you all have some questions for me. Uh, and I want to open up the floor. If you have a question, you can come up to the mic here, and I'd be happy to help answer that. Uh, thank you for this awesome presentation. And uh, I just want to know, can you upload images, uh, trackable images, uh, at runtime from Unity? <clears throat> so it is possible, but not as easy as we'd like it to be. So we haven't presented that as a feature. Uh, but I, I think what you're saying is you want to stream the images that you want to detect to the app. Right? Is that? that that's right. Yeah. So 
you can you can go through and pre-compile those databases uh, and then stream the databases to the app. Uh, and you can, if that pre-compilation step takes place on a server, then it can be completely dynamic. So the idea is you have a server in the cloud, uh, the application communicates with it, says, I want this group of images that we've already agreed on, or I just want this image. Uh, the server compiles that using the command line tool that's built in, uh, that's part of the SDK, and then streams the, da the resulting database uh, to the app, and then the database can use that to, uh, to detect images. I think uh, it's a very good question, and this is something that I think we want to make a little bit easier over time. Thank you. Um, also, I wanted to ask, uh, do clouds anchors in the previous example, do they remain uh, uh, saved somewhere on a server, or they just uh, go to waste when you close the app, or is it a, a developer decision? That's, that's another really good question. So you're asking, are cloud anchors persistent? Uh, do and what what are our guarantees about cloud anchors? And I'm going to have to give uh, an unsatisfying answer that our guarantee for cloud an anchors right now is that they'll persist for the session that you're in, and uh, and we'll probably make more uh, announcements about that at a later date. My, hey, thank you as well for the talk. And uh, my question would be, are you also planning on doing model recognition? You know, like 3D models being recognized? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I think, uh, uh, I think I can only speak personally for what I think, if I think that is an interesting path. So it's a kind of euphoria style 3D object recognition or 3D marker recognition. Well, I mean, not only euphoria, but you know, whenever you have a real object in space, like a real product, yeah. obviously you cannot recognize that with the image because it's not a flat space. Yeah. And it's a useful function as soon as you want to play I with Kegel. I, I think uh, uh, looking at various uh, geometries is, is interesting. Looking at arbitrary geometries maybe becomes a different problem. Uh, if you look at the cloud anchors feature, it's essentially that, right? Yes, we're, exactly. we're taking a space yeah. and we're compiling that into something that we can recognize. Yeah. And we just don't trim out the stuff that's not the object. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we've made, uh, we've made a decision to go in that direction for now. And we'll see based on user feedback uh, mm -hmm. if, if we still need to kind of circle back and, and evaluate generic uh, 3D markers. So it would be more like, uh, I mean, you're doing right now uh, form recognition, let's say. You're going through the space and it, you're creating these anchors, so you get an idea of the shapes that are existing and I could match somehow those up to models that are in my data. I, I would or. say that like taking, uh, taking a cloud anchor is generally meant to be used with a r actual unique real world location, yeah. not necessarily relative to an object, mm -hmm. uh, but you're free to experiment. All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Are cloud anchors available like right away or you just have to register an app in some kind of cloud dashboard and then tie Yeah, your so app. cloud anchors are available today. Uh, it's a cloud service, so you're going to uh, register that through that through uh, the developer council. Um, mm -hmm. And you'll basically get an API key. Uh, you'll enter that into a window in Unity, and then everything else is in Unity. You can oh. actually okay. go from that point to running our cloud anchor example in the SDK immediately. Okay, so there you. is a little bit about a little bit of Council management. Though. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Great. Thank you.